like more deer. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to start by acknowledging the custodians of this land or of the meeting and uh, uh, also acknowledge their uh, elders, past, present, and emerging. Too. Uh, I hope you don't mind me calling you friends. Some of you have been friends for a while. <coughs> Most of you I don't know, but uh, please allow me that privilege. I am also privileged to have been invited to come and speak to you. I must apologize to you about my short breath. I have a heavy bout of emphysema and the fan, and I'll take breaks here. <laughs> here. And, uh, I've got the some notes. Hold the microphone up a little bit. Again. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I've got some notes uh, abnormally to just remind me of a few pointers. Uh, speaking about Palestine, particularly at my age, is, is a nightmare. Uh, it, is, it is claimed that a few years ago there was an international competition about who can write most about the elephant. And just 10 minutes before the deadline, somebody came with a big tome and submitted his work. And it was by the title, The Elephant and the Alps. Five minutes later, somebody else came with three tomes and said, what, are you, what have you written about? And he said, well, the role of the elephant in human civilization. Then came a youth full of tomes and tomes and tomes. And they registered it. And they asked him, what have you written about? And he said, I've written about the elephant and the Palestine question. So that was really reflective of how much has been written and said about the Palestinian question. Now, uh, I want to uh, talk about only a small part uh, of the, the issue, the question of anti-Palestinianism. And probably uh, to squeeze as much as I can within 10, 15 minutes, may I just uh, use the technique of asking questions of myself and of you. And if you can think about these questions, maybe we realize why we have a problem. Uh, the, the world had recognized apartheid. I would like to ask why is it that our politicians here in Australia and everywhere else continue to resist describing Israel as an apartheid state. The, 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 the claim is that apartheid only relates to South Africa. That was true in the early days. For years now, apartheid has been part and parcel of international law. It is recognized as a global issue that goes beyond boundaries. And there are definitions of what constitutes Apartheid. So my question is why are our politicians, not just in Australia, but including in Australia, but also in the West, the guardians of international law and the so-called uh, world order, why do they continue to resist using that terminology? Uh, uh, when Amnesty International and the Israeli a, a human rights organization, Bezalem, have obviously recognized that. In fact, when 25% of American Jews consider Israel an apartheid state, and they are growing in numbers, why is it that the Israelis continue to think of themselves as the chosen people? I don't want to go in biblical terms. I have, I have come from a Christian background. I have trans transcended religion when I was 15, and I hope I'm a better person for it in, in that respect. Uh, but I don't think that any value system in the world, religious or otherwise, accepts that certain people have got precedence over others. This amounts to you know, supremacy to, to other descriptions that are negated by international law. Uh, uh, 
it was uh, Golda Meir, the first time she was referring to the Holocaust, that after the Holocaust, Jews can do whatever they, whatever they want. And obviously, that has created a lot of trouble, a lot of problems. Nobody can do whatever they want. We all have to have restraints bound by humanity and global, global uh, uh, values that binds us together as, as, as uh, human beings in our interrelationship. Uh, but that takes them to a sense of entitlement. Uh, we can do whatever they like, and the world will have to uh, accept that. Uh, why is it that Europe that had for a while a more advanced position on the Palestinian problem than Australia or the UK or the United States continue to drag its feet. Like today Israel does something that is criticized by the European Union and the following day the European Union signs a free trade agreement with Israel. Why? Why is it that Germany criticizes Israel for something they have done and the following day they sell them six submarines? Why is it that last week the Dutch uh, foreign minister criticizes Israel over certain activities but denies that Israel is an apartheid state? <coughs> All of these things are issues that we need to consider deeply. A, a very dear and knowledgeable journalist, you, whom I'm sure you all know, Gideon Levy, had an explanation as to why the world tolerates what's going on. Among other things, he speaks about the buying of politicians. And let me remind you about something that was relevant to us here in Australia. Kevin Rudd went to Israel and brought up the subject of nuclear disarmament. When he came back, he got a visit at Kerebi residence and with stiff warnings that this is not going to be raised again and it was not raised again. Uh, why is it that Israel is allowed to have nuclear weapons? We know it is known, it is established. Why nobody else has? I'm totally for total disarmament, nuclear disarmament all over the world. But as long as we accept that there are exceptions to that rule, that rule collapses. And it's every man for himself, and every man will do what he can to, to protect themselves. Uh, why is it that uh, UN resolutions by the dozens are ignored over a long time, never find the light of day to be implemented. Why? Why, why do we uh, you know, uh, deny the application of international law? Why do we deny the ability for the Palestinians to go and uh, request the intervention? of the International Criminal Court and the Court of Justice. It's theoretically allowed, but it, it doesn't happen. Why is it when every time there is a resolution in the Security Council of the United Nations, it is vetoed by, by the Americans? All of these things need consideration. According to Gideon Levy, that is, he had a, a lecture recently in Washington, and you'll find it on YouTube, and I strongly recommend that you see it. It is entitled Democracy and Human Rights in Israel. It's a National Press Club, Washington Report on the Middle East. It is a very worthwhile lecture to see. But according to him, there are many reasons. Uh, impact on politicians. <coughs> Uh, is one. The other thing, and the most important to his mind, was the fact that the Zionist movement had succeeded 
in creating a bogey called anti-Semitism. There's no doubt there is anti-Semitism by neo-fascist groups, but they are in the minority. They are not the majority. Most countries of the world have got laws against anti, uh, against uh, anti-Semitism, or for that matter, against discrimination. Whether they are applied or not is a separate matter, depends on the whims of the, this or that government. But this does exist. His view is that the Zionist movement has succeeded in creating a certain consciousness around the world, particularly in the West, that whatever the West criticizes Israel, the Zionist response is anti-Semitism. So you cannot criticize Zionism. There is a conflation of Zionism and Judaism, and, and hence, including the IHRA, which has been going around in, in Australia as, as well as everywhere else in the world, while it is considered a defense against anti-Semitism, in reality is a tool to muzzle the growing movement globally in defense of Palestinian rights. And the only way to stop that is to continue to intimidate. If you are observing what is happening all over the world, in the UK, in the US, many companies have lost businesses and contracts because they refuse to sign a document saying we will, we will not accept BDS, the boycott sanctions thing. Uh, uh, academics, students, uh, and so on and so forth. So it has become a tool of intimidation. It has got to that to that stage that even the lead author of the IHRA document has distanced himself from that document and said, "No, that's that's not what it was all about." There were eleven examples attached to the document, seven of which related to Israel. You cannot criticize Israel on anything. You cannot criticize Zionism on anything. Uh, according to our friend Gideon Levy, he said, uh, what is happening in Israel is Zionism has become the region in Israel, not Judaism, Zionism. <coughs> and the army is the Israeli God. <coughs> so the whole institution depends on a certain ideological standard whereby Zionism is, with all the mythology related to that, that have been spread all over the world, and uh, enforcing it by a very powerful army. Uh, Friday, uh, the Israeli army shot dead a 15-year-old kid, three shots in the head. Uh, this has become more and more fashionable after the Palestinian journalist who was shot in the head. Uh, to, today, actually, uh, is the day which is called the Day of the Flags. <laughs> Please warn me if I lose the microphone. Uh, and thousands upon thousands of extremely right-wing Zionists will be flooding to Jerusalem to get to the Al-Aqsa Mosque and raise the flags in an attempt to demolish, that's their purpose, eventually the Al-Aqsa Mosque and establish the third temple. Is it the third temple, Gideon? I think so. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see what, uh, how this is covered. Our media here is so bad, even the American media has gone ahead, miles ahead, of the Australian, and that includes my ABC. My ABC is becoming less and less my ABC. It has gone more and more and more right wing uh, <laughs> under the coalition. And I don't know whether the new government will be able to deal with that. Already there are quite a few characters implanted in, into the ABC and SBS for that matter that they are difficult to remove. But we have lost an asset. And, and it is no longer a trustworthy, to my mind, 
organizations we have written to them, comparing their coverage, for example, of what was happening in, uh, in Palestine with what is happening in uh, the Ukraine. We have written to them, uh, asking them about their coverage of uh, the murder of uh, uh, the Palestinian uh, Abu Abdi, the Palestinian journalist who was shot in the head. No, no response, and we do not expect to hear from them. But at least we let them know that we are aware of what is, uh, what is happening. Now, I have asked all the questions. We need an answer. We need an answer. It is not Zionist money that buys American congressmen. That helps, but it is not that. It is not that Zionists are very smart and intelligent with their propaganda, their hasparadic, their whatever it is. That is true. The real reason uh, is the enablers of Israel, looking at the enablers of Israel, including Australia. Sorry, that's where the problem lies. And let me go back to you in history. You have all heard of the Balfour Declaration, and everybody criticizes the Balfour Declaration. The British had given the land of a people to a people coming from all over the world, and that was not legal by international law. The British had no right promising Palestine as a Jewish homeland. Everybody talks about that. A lot of books have been written about that. But I'm afraid the real reason is, is a, a, a little more sinister. It was in 1907, and I discussed that with uh, Dr. Slezik. Uh, in 1907, Henry Campbell Bannerman, the British Prime Minister, invited seven foreign ministers from Europe, and they had a meeting. In, uh, in London. The discussion was about colonial interests in the Middle East. And the point of view was the colonial forces will lose all their interests in the Middle East unless they find a mechanism to keep the Middle East divided and at war with itself. The solution was we have to implant a new country right smack bang in the middle of the Middle East that will be totally reliant on the colonial masters for its survival and hence continue to serve our interests. That was 1907. To my mind, that is the father of the Balfour Declaration. And all the talk about the suffering of the Jews, the Holocaust, and poor people we need to find an estate and so This is all secondary. The real truth, which until today, is the case. It's not that colonialism had moved into imperialism and imperialism into neo-colonialism. I maintain that classical style colonialism is still around us in good health and being very active. And what is happening, this total enabling of Israel goes back to 1907. Israel is doing exactly what the colonial interests of the West wanted to do. <coughs> Look at it. All wars in the Middle East, all attempts to unite, all attempts to become independent economically and so on and so forth. The Middle East always wanted to have good relations with the West and the East. They were not allowed. They had to choose to their own detriment. And the situation is such that Israel is continues to serve colonial interests. Let me use that term to make it clear. Of, of the West. That West that are the guardians of international law and also the people who oversee the, our great world order uh, with all its uh, messes. So all of these things, and I will not go beyond this, harks back to 1907, real politics. And everything else that happens, we have to read it like that. No other way of reading it. There is no way anybody can enable Israel doing what they are doing without those people 
having a vested interest in allowing and covering Israel and helping Israel carry on with its project. Now, we have, uh, in, uh, I think it was in 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2019, when I first brought the question of IHRA. You're all familiar with IHRA? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I brought it to the attention of friendly politicians. And I told them that is very dangerous, and I told them to brace themselves for an onslaught by the Zionist movement in Australia. It is coming. I could see it coming. Uh, they said, oh, well, don't worry. We will continue to support Palestine. Now, uh, IHRA is here. And uh, they are uh, going into universities. They are going into municipal councils. And uh, the, the program, the campaign, is growing quickly. On our part, we were surprised by the silence, if not less than silence, by particularly the Labour Party on the question of IHRA. And the Labour Party had always been a, a, a close party to ourselves. We had nurtured a relationship with the Labour Party some 50 years ago, and it was all the time growing forward. There were hiccups, but that relationship was successful. Hence, there was a problem here, and it is dividing members of the Labour Party. This issue of the IHRA, opposition to the BDS. And I want to uh, touch upon BDS. It is uh, a fact that when the Palestinian arms struggle started in 1965, it hadn't been mentioned at all as a Palestinian case since 1948. And at first it was denounced by the Western protectors that this is violence and so on and so forth. But then the Palestinian movement went into peaceful struggle. And it is claimed that this started in 1993 after, after the Gulf War, which is rubbish. Uh, it is definitely started in 1974, when Yasser Arafat was in Geneva for the United Nations Convention, in which he declared, I have the weapon of a a revolution in one hand and an olive branch in another. Don't let me drop the olive branch. And he was saying this on the premise of the negotiations between PLO and America for the Palestinians to move towards international law to resolve this conflict with Israel. Of course, nothing happened. There had been massacre after massacre after massacre. And the place to do it was Lebanon, because the Israelis did not want any improvement of Palestinian, uh, Palestinian American relationships. At any rate, uh, this is where we are now. We are in a situation whereby uh, the clumsy issue is uh, the international lawyers of the Western countries are telling the Palestinians, you have got to negotiate. You have got to negotiate. 30 years of negotiation, and nothing happens. You know, I, 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 I say, I compare this to a child having a slice of uh, pizza in his hand, and the sumo wrestler coming and snatching that slice of pizza uh, uh, and starts trumping. And the kid starts crying and the guardians of international law come and say, what's going on? And the kid said, you know, he snatched this piece of pizza from my hand. Ah, not you, you shouldn't do that. I'll tell you what, we put you in this iron cage, both of you, go in, we'll lock you up, we will not let you out until you have negotiated a solution. And the Sumer wrestler, of course, continues. Trumping. This is where we stand. The status quo, Palestine is disappearing. And any concept of a two-state solution 
has become really impossible. And I must say also that the other point of view of a one-state solution is also a romantic expression. It's very difficult to have two-state solution, but now, in this state of balance of power, to say, let's work for a one-state solution is jumping hoops. When I go to the West Bank to visit, they stop me for three, four hours at the border because I happen to be of Palestinian rules or from Jerusalem, so, let alone the question of the, the uh, right of return of six million Palestinians, which, by the way, the recognition of Israel in 1949 by the United Nations was conditional on the application of the right of return. But that's another matter that's also disposable in, in the overall uh, realm of things. So, so the one-state solution also is not feasible. It's, it's a romantic ploy. And the reason why I'm saying this is I don't want people to back up their own tree. We are having tremendous difficulty with the two-state solution. Let's go for a one-state solution. Neither is feasible. What is feasible is a change of balance of power. Without a change of balance of power, nothing is going to happen. Not two states, not one state, and I always besiege the only support groups uh, for Palestine to forget about this redundant argument about two states or one state. The fact of the matter, neither is feasible at this stage of balance of power. What we need to do is to change the balance of power. And hence, because the establishment, the political establishment, political economic establishment of the West will not accept that willingly at this stage, it is up to the people of the West to make that possible by putting pressure on their governments, just as happened in the South African case. That will not be the strategy, but that is one thing that will create and will generate a gradual change in balance of power that may convince, to begin with, Western uh, establishment, political and economic, that we've got to do something about this, otherwise we, we, we lose a lot of our influence, and might convince the Israelis that there is no escaping finding a genuine solution to this. At the moment, the majority of Israelis don't need to have a political solution. The status quo is very comfortable for them. Yes, once in a while they send their troops here and there, but the fact of life, they are gobbling land more and more every day. The fact of life is they're gobbling natural resources every day, making life difficult. They are changing the character of the cities, including in Jerusalem, where the names of places have been changed and people don't realize them. So what I'm talking about is an indication to what I would hope supporters of a just peace in the Middle East would go for in terms of pressurizing these governments, these establishments, into saying, let's look at a genuine solution, and the status quo is no longer acceptable. Thank you very much. Okay, well, let me uh, echo Eddie in, in acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. That's a pretty pertinent observation because we're also talking about the, part, the plight of the indigenous people of Palestine. Um, I'm pleased as the understudy for Bob Carr to be on the same platform uh, as, as Eddie, whose analysis of the Palestinian situation in every public forum I've ever come across, Eddie, has been thoughtful, penetrating, uh, with a nice historical uh, touch. So it's great to be here this afternoon after last Saturday's election. We meet in the spirit of, um, of Alice Beecham, and I want to thank my wonderful friend Frank Stilwell for teaching economics to somebody called Anthony Albanese. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, well, I'm probably going to repeat a certain amount of what, uh, what Eddie said. I'm just going to um, uh, whip through the, this absurd reverence and propaganda, really, about the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, the International the Holocaust Remembrance Association. Um, am I... Okay, that better, sorry. Um, because there's a massive imbalance between the preoccupation around the world with anti-Semitism and an almost complete ignorance of anti-Palestinianism until the, in some ways, until the publication by the Australian Arab Federation of this first significant document, only four pages, um, on uh, the meaning of anti-Palestinianism. It's weird that the IHRA definition has, um, has gathered so, so much momentum and has been almost taken for granted. I'd have to say by people who look as though, looks, sound to me as though they've never read it. Um, the, it, it, it talks about, it talks about uh, uh, anti-Semitism as being merely discrimination against people on the basis of being Jews of Israel. As, 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 um, as Eddie mentioned, seven of the 12 points in the, in the IHRA definition are illustrations of what happens to people of Israel. Uh, and the the, the rush to adopt it in, um, in, uh, by politicians, in um, local, local government, and more recently in universities, um, is, is, occurs despite the very significant criticism of this document all over the place. I mean, Geoffrey Robinson, the barrister, said it was full of misrepresentation, totally confusing, uh, that you couldn't um, rely on it to analyse anything. The wonderful um, Jewish American academic Norman Finkelstein said it was a completely slovenly piece of work that contributed nothing to dialogue. The Israeli professor of human rights law uh, at the Hebrew University originally, Neve Gordon, said in the um, London Review of Books that it was merely there to um, weaponize uh, anti Semitism, to stifle any criticism of Israel. And, um, and Peter, though he's disappeared to go to the opera, uh, Peter Slezak, um, that's terrible, maybe, that he should have done that, um, uh, reminded me that the, the very significant N American NGO, um, uh, American, uh, Americans for, for Peace, said that it was, it was that anti-Semitism is merely weaponized by the IHRA definition to stifle free speech. So that so, and, and yet, the, it's being adopted as the gold standard. And Kenneth Stern was the guy who crafted it originally, and, and, and he's repeated that he didn't expect it to be the gold standard by which to justify hate speech. So, my question to the Vice Chancellors, respectively, of Melbourne University in Sydney, and I'll tell you why in a minute, why they, why they think that, that it's a good idea to adopt it, it looks to me as though they, don't, they haven't read it. But I, I'm, I mean, I, there's a sense in which not much reading seems to go on in universities since that's certainly not by this phenomenon called management. Now let's deal with, but the, the, the contrast uh, of, of between the, the concern with anything that looks like anti-Semitism. I mean, the charge of anti-Semitism should be taken seriously, along with Islamophobia, homophobia, any kind of bigotry and discrimination. But you can't use it as a kind of knee-jerk reaction without thinking in order to, uh, to uh, avoid the accusation that you didn't say it. I mean, a lot of people are signing this document, adopting it, for fear of the accusation that they didn't adopt it. Um, and, and I'll come to that. Let's have a look at the business of anti-Palestinianism that, that gets completely ignored. The, the the brutal occupation of Palestinian lands has been going on really since 1948-1949. The, the, the brutal occupation of the West Bank for over 50 years, we're into the 16th year of the siege of Gaza. I mean, why, why on earth do people go home after their quarter of a million dollar salaries in, in, um, in our nation's capital? Without, without much thought about that. Of course, there are some brilliant exceptions um, led by the man who looks as though he's going to be the next speaker, uh, and Andrew, Andrew Wilkie. The, uh, 
the anti-Palestinianism is almost incessant. Like Golda Meir, of the first, I thought she was the first prime, prime, no, prime minister of, um, of Israel, said the Palestinians didn't exist. I mean, nothing could be more uh, stigmatizing than to say a people don't exist. They are of no, they're not really human beings. They are of no consequence. Um, the present Prime Minister of, of Israel, Naftali Bennett, said that um, I've killed a lot of Palestinian Arabs in my time, and what is wrong with that? Now, if anybody even sniffed those words about one Jewish person, there would be outrage around the globe. And, um, um, and echoing Naftali Bennett, although in some ways he was his teacher, um, Netanyahu said, you know, over his dead body would there ever be a Palestinian state. So the, the, the anti-Palestinianism is, is, is daily. I mean, I, Eddie and I haven't been able to keep up with, in the past few days, how many young Palestinians have been killed. I was, I was in the Gaza Strip just before the March of Return, and, uh, to, began in March 2018. 200, over 200 young people were shot dead by Israeli snipers in that march of return, in that, in, in that protest. And it's all, it's all regarded as, as of, of little consequence. Eddie's referred to the, the murder of Shireen uh, Abu Akhlai uh, last week, and that was preceded by the murder of other Arab, of other, um, other Palestinian journalists, whose deaths whose murder received almost no attention at all. And then, of course, you get the other, the almost programmed reaction of the Israeli government, that it, was, that it probably wasn't us, it was probably a Palestinian. And then the, the wise people in um, Bonn and Westminster and Washington and Canberra uh, take that Israeli, immediate Israeli denial as, as, um, as plausible. Let me refer now quickly to bring it home to a motion by the uh, student union, it's about a month ago, about three weeks ago, the Melbourne University Students Union, who passed a motion about taking the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement seriously to, to hinder uh, the Israeli oppression of the people of Palestine. They passed that motion. Uh, a few days later, the student union up the road, to their credit, passed a motion urging student activists to take part in commemorating the Nakba, the day of tragedy for the people of Palestine. And in response to those two motions, the respective vice chancellors of both universities reprimanded the students and said their motions were anti-Semitic. Oh. No, no. <laughs> Um, it's, out, it, 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 it's outrageous. The anti-Semitism is like, it's like a, a virus that, that, that um, people, that the, the Zionist movement wants to penetrate people's consciousness. Never more so than in a state a meeting of the um, state Labour Party at a conference when there was a motion about adopting the IHRA definition along with about several hundred other motions. And the agreement was, remember this is about nine months ago, in the run up to the election, please don't let's cause any trouble. If that if that's becomes visible, um, we'll, we'll lose votes. So it was agreed by the delegates, admittedly there were about several hundred of them, and admittedly it was being done by Zoom. The next thing they know, uh, uh, that the, on the Monday, the conference was on a Saturday, on the Monday it was reported that the conference had unanimously passed an motion to adopt the IHRA definition. And 95% of the delegates knew nothing about it. <coughs> By slate of hand, the son of the former Melbourne, uh, former MP for Melbourne Ports, what was his name? Michael Danby. Danby. His son from Enfield South had slipped the motion into, into a set of motions concerned with Aboriginal welfare and, and, the, and the welfare of uh, people with a disability. And it was to go through, they knew it was to go through on the nod. Nobody else knew about it. I wrote, immediately wrote an article about it because that, uh, and, and named the people involved. But even for a journal that usually accepts my, my, my submissions, and they, we argued for a week with the 
junior editor supporting me and the senior editor opposing, saying, we don't want to name anybody. We're going, we might offend people. You've got to have, if, eventually I've got an ultimatum <coughs> saying, you know, either, if, if you take the names out, you will publish. If you don't take the names out, we won't publish. So this kind of fear of, of uh, offending that lobby is, is, is just awful. But in response to that, let me give credit to, the, to the, um, my colleagues and good friends in the, um, in the Australian Arab uh, Federation who produced this document. There are certain highly significant principles in, in the statement about anti-Palestinianism that should be as take become uh, as taken for granted as the assumption that, that anti-Semitism was all over the place. I mean, the first is concerns the the rights of Palestinians embedded in the Geneva Conventions and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to to their rights to self-determination, their rights to uh, a country of their own, albeit from uh, Eddie's point of view, not to be achieved until this huge power imbalance is addressed. It's also about the, uh, the, the rights to be able to remember history, to be able to remember the Nakba. Remember, it's a criminal offense in Israel to mention the, the Nakba. But when you think that the Nakba is part of a foundation stone, a bit of ironical foundation stone of the state of Israel, uh, there's a plea for um, the recognition of Palestinian leaders and representatives on international bodies around the world, like, uh, like UNESCO, for example. There's a plea to please cease this business, this corrosive, evil business of collective punishment, which the, which the um, Israelis go in for. Let's just say one Palestinian, uh, young Palestinian, let's say, on the West Bank is committed, has committed an offense. So in consequence, the whole of the family and the networks of anybody who might be known to him are then punished in terms of their homes being demolished, uh, or, or the people evicted and so on. <clears throat> There's a kind of beautiful set of themes that run through the document of which Eddie is one of the architects. And it's very important for us, I think, to remember what the themes... In. It's about the right to advocate their interests. It's about the right to protest. It's about the right to resist. That's, that's inherent for, for, every, for everybody. If we lose, if we lose that, um, I mean, we, as Eddie says, well, there's this huge double standard going on around the world. We're all applauding the resistance, the right to resist of the people of Ukraine, but we dare not say a word about the people of Palestine. So, uh, May we build a kind of dawning consciousness and resistance arising from the sort of things that uh, Eddie's been saying and from the, the detail in this document. And um, um, as a non-violent person, I will oppose uh, putting the vice chancellors of Melbourne and Sydney University in the stocks. <laughs> Thanks very much, both of you. Um, I'll address the, these remarks to both of you um, for, for dealing with this issue of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which is a very spurious campaign, which is problematic because it presents itself as dealing with anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism isn't the issue. It's about Palestinians, and that's the double header. And the issue is, I think, you know, the, the question of anti-Semitism is real. But it's problematic when we deal with it in isolation from all the other racisms we've got arising around the world at this time. with xenophobia, anti-indigenous rights, um, Islamophobia. All these forms of racism um, are part of this uh, far-right um, manifestation, which certainly bleed into the mainstream, as we've seen here in Australia. But I think in response to this very duplicitous campaign, we need a two-header um, response. On the one hand, responding to these, this very bad definition of anti-Semitism, which just simply uses it to, to um, block any Palestinian voice, or block any criticism of Israel, and um, have a real uh, proper definition of anti-Semitism. And on the other hand, the anti-Palestinianism statement will challenge the actual agenda 
And I think both things are necessary to have a, if we, it is a good answer to anti-sexism, say you don't want the IHRA, well we've got another better alternative. I think that's a useful thing to do. Yeah, yeah look, great point and um, not, no, no surprise that that was made by Vivian, who's a wonderful campaigner for basic decency and human rights. Um, the, there was, in response to, in a way, in response to what Vivian said, about 200 Jewish scholars wrote the Jerusalem Declaration of Anti-Semitism, which repeats almost what you say. So, well, look, every kind of bigotry and discrimination based on race is should be eroded, should be addressed. It's not. Israel is not exceptional. Please don't make a special case about protecting Israel as well. That's my, my recollection of it. Uh, uh, yes, uh, of course, Vivian, we've discussed this before, and uh, there's no doubt there are two issues here. Actually, there are many issues, but let's summarize them with the Jewish issue and the Palestinian issue. Uh, and this has to be taken care of. What we stood was the, the Jewish issue needs to be taken up by the Jewish people. That's, that's who the rightful owners of this issue, defense against anti-Semitism, are the Jewish people. They will get the support of the Palestinian, and for that matter, all peace-loving and justice-loving people across the world. They will, they will get that, and, and there is no doubt in my mind that the majority of the peoples of the world are very sensitive to issues of, of anti-Semitism. Yeah. Uh, I, I have no doubt there are the neo-Nazis and the Israelis, of course, the, you know, but the majority of people are not like that. And it is the same regarding the Palestinians. The Palestinians have got to find it. The issue is how can we uh, marry them together? to establish a, a front against the establishment, so to speak. In Australia, poll after poll, 73% of the Australian population voted in favor of Palestinians and Palestinians. 73%, year after year. Yet we cannot translate that into policy of the Australian, successive Australian governments. Let's put it frankly. Why is that? You know, that's another query that we should, we should ask. We, we need to find the mechanisms of how we can translate people's wishes into policies. And that means, like, when we were speaking about two states versus one state, history goes back in circles. In 1968, the Palestinians proposed a democratic, secular state in Palestine where Jews, Christians, and Muslims would live in joint equal rights. It was rejected. It was rejected by the Israelis. They had won a war. They felt powerful. No need for them to do it. It was rejected by the West. And it was rejected by the West. They don't want peace. They want another phase of Israel to carry out the work of the 1907 conference. That is why it's not going to happen. And that's why I was insistent that we all together need to change that balance of power, working against our establishment, political, economic, to force them to change their minds. This is the only hope. There's no military solution. There's no two-state solution. There's no one-state solution that will drop out of the sky. It's got to happen through the hard work of the populations of the world. And the only reason why the IHRA was brought about is because the Zionists had realized that the Palestinian cause was gaining ground, particularly in the West and in the United States. The, the, the support groups were growing very much that Israel, the Zionists, felt threatened by this, and they needed to do something to muzzle all those uh, support groups. And that's something that, that uh, we need uh, to take care of. Uh, I just uh, have copies of the uh, a statement, uh, anti-Palestine statement, uh, that we published uh, a few months back. Uh, uh, I will, will be distributed to you now. There is also a statement as a result of a, a public uh, meeting that we had with the community 
and that need certain resolutions, including <coughs> fight, fighting back against the IHRA and denouncing, actually, the New South Wales uh, uh, Council, the upper house, the Parliament in Parliament, for having endorsed the IHRA, both, both major parties. And again, it was passed like, like many other things. <coughs> and we were going to fight that. When I mentioned it in 2019, as I said before, I pointed out to our friends, I said, you know, we come from difficult backgrounds. You know, Australia politics is a gentle thing here. You know. It's a democratic society. <laughs> there is a way of doing things. No, we didn't have that upbringing. We had very hard upbringing, you know. Occupations, regimes that are nasty, imprisonment, uh, 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 going underground, assassinations at times, and so, so we had, we were trained to accept the difficulties and the challenges. And when I was speaking in 2019 about the IHRA, I said, any law that comes out that is not based on justice is a law designed to be broken by the people. And I said, if that law happens, we are going to break it. And let's get the challenge to a certain level of equity whereby uh, it will become a major issue internally. And this is where we need to go with the IHRA. I was asked, you know, I was asked whether, which is more important for me, that Australia recognizes the state of Palestine or we bury the IHRA in Australia. And my answer is it would be nice if Australia recognized the state of Palestine. That would be, that is a project that I had started in 1975. It's been nearly 47 years in the making. But what is more important than that, because of our background, it's a background of strength, is that we are allowed in Australia, as well as anywhere else in the world, to continue our strength without the legal force of the establishment cracking down on us and saying, you know, we throw you in prison if you went out on the street. In Germany, two weeks ago, a Jewish group, progressive, sought permit from the German government to go out on the street to denounce what happened uh, with Shireen Abu Abli and to commemorate the, the Nakba. The German government, the German government refused to give them permit. And the reason they gave is that it might stimulate anti-Semitism in oh. Germany. You can see where, where, where we're heading. You know, it's, uh, now, eventually, people went out on the street and demonstrated despite the German government. And if it meant clashes with the police, there was, it was going to be clashes with the police. No, I don't. Yes. So, so this is what I'm, what I'm talking about. Now, we have talked and we can talk some more, my friends. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to get down to a practical issue. How can we all here contribute within our means? And I know we all have restraints and everything. To this, to this fight, you know, how, how can we make sure that the Palestinian voice is heard? How can we make sure we contribute to the popular opinion in Australia to be respected by our political establishment? How can we make sure we put an end to the IHRA? How can we make sure our relationship with the Jewish community here improves? I was speaking, addressing Jewish community here as long as 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, but can you, can you explain who the IHRA are? I have missed that, I'm sorry. The IHRA. And can you also tell us what the document is you're referring to that Eddie had something to do with on the yeah. table? This costs five hundred dollars <laughs> each. This, this, this. Uh, and you can have two for for one for the first. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the IHRA is the International Holocaust Remembrance 
that Remembrance Association. It was started in, in Austria, I think. Budapest. 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 Yes. And the original author saw it as, uh, as a means of helping protect Jews against anti-Semitism. It was hijacked very quickly. Examples of its application were attached to it, 11 of them, which, by the way, are very controversial. So if you Google the IHRA document, more often than not, you will not see the examples. The examples have been disguised and hidden and taken off, off the website so that people cannot see the real reason behind the IHRA as Muslim being the pro-Palestine movement. And, and uh, that's why uh, Mr. Stern, who was the lead author, withdrew and, and criticized it. This is, not, this is not what we wrote it about. And, and other Jewish academics and so on and so forth uh, made statements and came up with alternatives. An alternative was the Jerusalem Declaration and that's, that's something for our Jewish uh, uh, friends. One of the documents that you will see is, is a statement from the public meeting. And we spelled it out clearly. We are an organization that's against any form of discrimination, uh, be it anti-Palestinianism, uh, Islamophobia, or anti-Semitism. And, and uh, uh, I, I don't want to speak about relationship with Jewish friends here, who are here. This had been a long, long uh, association. But I'm talking about, about the Jewish community generally. They've got to stop believing that Israel cannot be beaten. And hence, they've got to stop thinking that uh, we don't have to do anything. It's fine. Israel is capable of getting away with it. So why should we worry? So we continue to give support to Israel. It is very important that the Jewish community in Australia wake up to this fact and say, let's extend our arms to everybody else in Australia to fight for a just solution that will be relevant to Jews, to Christians, to Muslims, and let's get done with this, with this uh, eternal issue. It will meet resistance <laughs> among the Jewish community and with the powers that be, but there's, there is no other solution. Thanks very much, Eddie. Um, it's come to 5.15. It's time to wind up the formal part of the program. Um, unless there's someone really wanting to say something more, otherwise I'd encourage you just to come up and see Stuart and Eddie afterwards. Well, one other point. What do you think of the, the, uh, the Zionist campaign against Jeremy Corbyn? In, uh, in Britain. I think this is a, a huge, I'm hoping it will be a huge shot in, the, in their own foot because it's so transparent and so reprehensible. What, have you got any opinion on that and, and maybe what we can do? Okay, quickly. The question's about the Jeremy Corbyn attacks. Look, the encouraging public life is, is pretty rare. And they were all ducking for cover in order to give an, air, an, an aura of respectability about, about um, that leader of the Labour Party. I mean, he was the only Western leader who spoke openly about his support for the Palestinian people. That was, that was, the, that was the attack on Corbyn. And then the, we remember 75% of, of the British media are on, run by uh, the, the tabloid industry, Murdoch's tabloid industry. So, so derision became synonymous with journalism, and, and Corbyn became a target. And, and the Labour Party didn't find the courage to speak out about it. That they, they just let the, the, the critics within the Labour Party um, um, put Corbyn in the stocks and deride him um, for the, to, avoid, uh, to avoid appearing to support what they said was anti-Semitism. It could have been derided easily, but it was, but it was not. If I may make a quick comment on this. Uh, before Jeremy Corbyn, uh, two 
members of the Israeli embassy in London were accused of playing games uh, against conservative MPs who were making statements in support of Palestine. They were caught and they were sent outside London, but you know, this is ongoing. It is, it is a very professional situation. Jeremy Corbyn was a meteorologist. He had, he had a view of the world that is not very common among, among uh, the powers that he doesn't suit them. And to us here, uh, I'm not be saying a, a secret, we were hoping very much that we would get the Australian Labour Party and the British Labour Party to coordinate a joint effort. And it, that would have been very important. And hence, uh, uh, Albanese flew to London and, and met with, uh, with Jeremy Corbyn. And then there were some discussions and so on and so forth. But then Jeremy Corbyn was massacred and Anthony Albanese took steps back and made his statements to the, to the Jews, which was unfortunate. I had a lot of respect for Anthony Albanese, but he has really damaged, done, done a lot of damage. And it, it is going to take a big effort to mend fences with him and, and we give him enough time to find his feet again and really sort this issue out. But I do know that he had been very good on Palestine in previous times. And we need to get back to that to that position. So the importance of that, I'm sorry I'm diverging, think of it this way. Two Anglo-centric nations, part of the five eyes, would have broken up with the five eyes on the question of Palestine. That is an earthquake politically, if it happened. So they were not going to let it happen. There was bloodshed, etc. Okay, there you go. Um, yeah, there is a Labour Party policy for recognition of the state of Palestine, so we can do something about that, and you can tell it will be a struggle. Okay, so um, thank you very, very much to Eddie and to Stuart once more for your answers to the questions. Thank you both.